go live. Yeah, there's a bit of a delay with Facebook. Possibly. Yeah. All right, we're live. We're just going to wait for uh, a couple of uh, people to join yeah. us. Yeah, yeah. Ah, lovely. Okay. Are they showing up? Yeah, yeah, of course they are. They are. We are, we are uh, you know, we are getting uh, a lot of uh, viewers rapidly. We're just going to wait for like maybe uh, about half a minute or so, and then uh, we start, uh, we get the ball rolling. That sounds perfect. All right. Okay. Um, all right. So let's go. Good evening, Dogspot family. My name is Sahil Sharma, and I'm a canine trainer and behaviorist based in Mumbai, India. Um, I've been training dogs since 2014, and um, I have studied under Shirin Merchant, uh, Anil Kivago, Adnan Khan, and uh, Sanjay and KP. And I'm currently pursuing a scent work uh, course with the School of Canine Science UK. Um, I am joined tonight by, uh, well, of course, having a small fanboy moment over here. So please just forgive my stammering and stuttering. Uh, uh, we're joined here today, uh, tonight, with uh, Denise Fenzi. Denise is, of course, uh, as many of you all would know, Denise is uh, an excellent dog trainer and uh, a prolific writer. I'm sure a lot of you have read her books. Um, and of course, she, uh, has excelled in various fields of dog training and of course has titled a variety of dogs across uh, you know a variety of sports um, but you know what enough about uh, you know me yapping on about it because probably i might just go on and on and on denise i'm gonna hand this over to you it's all yours thank you it's nice to be here every time you say good evening i get confused because it's well I let me start off with <laughs> Let me start off with good morning to you then. <laughs> good morning. Good morning to those of you who are uh, in the morning and good evening to those of you who are heading to bed soon. So uh, thank you for having me. This is going to be fun. Right. So Denise, if you could just uh, tell us a little about yourself. I mean, um, to be very honest with you, a lot of dog trainers in, from India follow you. Um, and are aware of your work, but just for the ones who are to be initiated, I think this would be a fantastic opportunity. Sure, I've been training uh, for about 40 years. I started when I was a kid, so I kind of was born into a family doing this. So I was competing when I was, you know, 10. Uh, and I did lots and lots of dog sports. I think I've done very close to all of them, at least uh, over time, and mostly competition, that's where I started. Then more I've been looking at behavior. So I went the backwards way. Most people I think go from behavior and pet training to competition training. I went the yeah. other way. Uh, wow. And uh, now I'm sort of in between. I'm fascinated by dog behavior, but I don't work a lot with individuals. I work with groups right. and uh, I just do a lot of, uh, so for example, I have a young dog here, he's seven months old. And often whatever is in front of me is what I'm interested in, right? So I get fascinated by what I observe and then I want to know more. So then I ask other people, I say, this is what I'm seeing. And I love that Facebook has the opportunity for kind of an open dialogue. So you can say, you know, I noticed that after I exercised my dog, when he came in the house, he was uh, kind of hyper for an hour or two. And I haven't seen that right. with other dogs. So it's another right. opportunity to use sort of a, a party of one. Yes, I have mm -hmm. one dog that I study, but I've had so many and I've worked with, I don't know, thousands, probably thousands of dogs, I guess, wow. uh, over a long time. And then you can start to put the puzzle pieces together. And so the, you asked right. me, what did I want to talk about today? And I said, the thing that's on my mind is the relationship between arousal and reactivity, because I think it makes a very easy way for people who are struggling with their dog's behavior to think about how to improve their dog's behavior, uh, because that's what I'm actively working on. So I'm very aware of how before my dog behaves in a reactive way. And when I say reactive, mm -hmm. I mean uh, to react. So mm -hmm. 
in the world if a dog reacts to something we that may be considered normal so if a person is breaking into your house and your dog reacts you would say that's normal but if you're just walking down the street and your dog sees a perfectly friendly dog and your dog reacts we would say that's out of context and inappropriate so then we call that reactivity and there's a negative Correct. connotation there Correct. and so what's interesting to me is watching how before a dog reacts you can observe arousal and arousal mm -hmm. is just energy, right? So just an increase in our ener energy is arousal. And that is the moment that you really want to become involved in your dog's behavior if you don't want to see the reaction. So if mm -hmm. the arousal is my dog comes up on his toes, his ears go up, his breathing starts to go <laughs> like that. Rapid. The rapid breathing, that is the yes. arousal. And then the next thing, if I don't right. stop the behavior is a reaction, which might be a lunge, it might be a bark, it might be up on his back legs. So where do I want to interrupt the behavior? And the place mm -hmm. I want to interrupt it is arousal. Now, right. how do I want to interrupt the behavior? I want to reduce yes. the arousal. Because yes. if the trigger, the trigger is the thing that causes this whole process. That's what we call a trigger. And there could be yes. many triggers. For some dogs, it's a, a deer a car, yes. a person, a dog, that's a trigger and they vary. Mm -hmm. So you know your dog's triggers after a while, you start to become very sophisticated about triggers. Right. So you see a trigger, that puts you on notice. Now you see the beginnings of arousal. And then I say to myself, on a scale of one to 10, where is my dog in arousal? Mm -hmm. 10 is the worst thing you can imagine, screaming, spinning, no getting him back. And one yep. is kind of sleepy. Right. And I know with my own dog, I don't want him above about a four or five. Because if he hits a four or a five, his tendency to go to 10 is quick. So first yes. I say, what is the trigger? Ah, I see a dog coming. Now I look at my dog. He's at a three. Oh, okay, that's fine. At a three, I can work with my dog. Mm -hmm. If that dog comes closer, I see my dog go to a four. So now I'm going to say to myself, what are my options to prevent my dog from going to a five? I can yeah. get further away. I can move away. My dog, I can put him on a downstay. This does not work for all dogs. So you want to know, does your dog get calmer or more frantic if you put him on a stay? My dog gets calmer. So if mm -hmm. I put my dog on a downstay, there's a very good chance I can stay at a four. Mm-hmm. My other uh, dogs that I've done a fair amount of work with in arousal, I had a different experience. For them, a downstay just uh, uh, made them anxious. And then when I would yep. say, okay, and let them up, they'd explode. So for uh -huh. those dogs, what I would do is keep them on their feet. So I say to people, you need to know if movement or stillness lowers your dog's arousal. Mm -hmm. So my dog stopped his movement. Now, what if, what if the thing is there? And it's not moving and i need to get past it i need to go somewhere all mm -hmm. right but i know that my dog does best not moving so now i have a problem mm -hmm. well how about speed what if i keep his speed down that keeps the right ride. what if i feed right. for a lot of dogs food keeps the arousal down but the one i mentioned to you and i think is so powerful with a lot of people don't walk at triggers circle I call yes. it a circle walking, spirals. Correct. There's something calming for a lot of dogs about one, keep that leash loose. It's super important if you have a dog that sees triggers that you do not allow pulling because pulling mm -hmm. amps the dogs. Most dogs, pulling causes arousal. And we've already said right. arousal causes reactivity. So you have a chain. You can break mm -hmm. that anywhere in that chain. You can break it. The sooner you break it, the more you can work with the dog. But no matter mm -hmm. what, you want to break the chain. So circling, yeah. I think what happens is, let's say the trigger is at 12 o'clock on a clock, mm -hmm. and you're the center of the clock. Mm -hmm. If you head from 6 o'clock directly to 12 o'clock, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and the dog's arousal goes up, 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 and you have a problem. Mm -hmm. But if instead of going from 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock, you veer over to 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Then it would be 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock. So you're slowly circling up. Absolutely. Your dog sees the thing, starts to get a little up, but then you start circling him away, starts to calm him down. And every time mm -hmm. you circle in and he sees and you circle out, 
the knowledge, the comfort that it's there. I see the thing, it's there. I'm not dead yet. It's okay. The dog acclimates. And now you can get right. close. I tell people it's a little bit like, let's say you don't like spiders. Let's say you're afraid. And there's a spider on the wall. Do you want to walk straight at the spider? How fast do you want to go? The faster yes. you go to the spider and the more direct, the more arousing it is to you. How about if you look at the spider, turn away, walk in a circle. Look at the spider, turn away, walk in a circle. Can you feel how you could get yeah. much just a little bit at a time? You have a chance to adapt. You have a chance to count its legs. You have a chance to say, is it furry? <laughs> Can I see <laughs> the if, if uh, so, I I, I have uh, one of my very dear friends. She has an acute phobia of lizards. So I think if you just replace the word spider with lizards, uh, Mira, this is for you if you're watching us. Um, <laughs> I, I think this would be like this would be like so this would be so much fun to discuss. You know? Yeah. Oh, it's so nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you yes. Can ask yourself. Your friend can say to herself, "What factors can I do? Can I sit in a chair?" Some people think about humans. <laughs> Some people yeah. pace when they're agitated and mm -hmm. some people sit. Some people go catatonic, right? They just they just stop yes. moving. Yes. And other people get hysterical and they move, yes. move, move. I am, and this should not surprise many, I move. I cannot sit right. still when I'm agitated. I cannot eat right. when I'm agitated. Right. I'm a patient. Right. Okay. But I have friends that eat. That's how they calm themselves ah. down. They sit and they eat. I'm right. under a lot of stress. I lose weight and I move. Mm -hmm. Just like dogs, oh. right? So it's just the yes. same. Absolutely. You say, what calms this person? And if you take a person or a dog who needs mm -hmm. to move to clear the adrenaline and the energy and you make them sit, you mm -hmm. make them agitated and upset. They have nowhere to go. And yes. if you take a person who needs to sit and calm and eat and you try to make them move, you hype mm -hmm. them up, you agitate them. So, so look at your dog and say, what causes comfort for this dog? What Brings right. the arousal down. And so the things I suggest, I love the circling. I mm -hmm. love the keeping the leash loose. Mm -hmm. I love recognizing, I'm on a, a podcast. I love recognizing that mm -hmm. some dogs need to not move. Mm -hmm. And then I like to look at the thing, the, the trigger that's out there, and I need to ask myself, yeah. Do I need to get further away? What can I do on a scale of one to 10 to get my dog under a five? Yes. So if there's Correct. a spider on the wall, how about if I stop moving towards it? Right, a lizard. How about time? There's a spider <laughs> on the wall. How about if I grab a yes. chair and just sit 10 feet from that spider and observe it? Mm -hmm. Don't go closer, mm -hmm. just sit. And then you start to feel, I'm starting to relax. Okay, maybe I can scoot my chair six inches forward, right? So. Oh. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I've been there long yes. enough, right? Mm -hmm. And then I ask mm -hmm. myself, time. Yeah. So for some of us, time soaking in calms this. But mm -hmm. time can have the opposite effect too. Sometimes yes. it's what we call trigger stacking. Mm -hmm. And it's like I say we use up all our good brain cells. The dog uses up all their good brain cells in the first five minutes. And then it's so much work to be good that they get tired and they run out of good, and then True. they start to react badly. Right. So Denise, um, you know, when we speak about, uh, you know, canine arousal, um, or even over arousal to that matter. So when we speak about, uh, you know, um, when we as trainers, we work with dogs in a low arousal state, um, a lot of us, even probably across the world, tend to, you know, take what we call uh, the high arousal situation. We for some reason want to box it up and just put it away. Of course, this isn't the case of pet dogs. Okay. Um, do you think that, you know, of course, making a dog work in a high arousal situation, when you train your dog in a high arousal situation, you know, where they're really tweaked up, do you think that that could contribute in, um, you know, at least getting a semblance of control over your dog? When, say, for uh, if they happen to, you know, go into that over arousal state, do you think that the owner could get a semblance of control over their dog at that point of time? Well, it's quite a So what I tell people is you can't train a behavior when you need it. So you need mm -hmm. to train it before you need it. So uh, yes. the time to teach your dog sit is not in the middle of a catastrophe. It's too late, right? Mm -hmm. So you always want to teach and train in low arousal. 
mm -hmm. then put the dog in more arousing circumstances over time so the dog can practice those behaviors. Uh, yes. I'm a pretty big fan of looking at the dog in front of you. I, I always train the dog in front of you. I wrote a book, train the dog in front of you. And <laughs> what I'm talking about is again, study your dog. So um, I work with working breeds. I like high energy dogs. I like the shepherds mm -hmm. and the Belgians. I love those kind of dogs. And mm -hmm. I tell people, you have to satisfy their needs. So okay. a dog like that, you can't just keep saying, be calm, be calm. If you wanted all that calm, you got the wrong kind of dog. It's not, it, that's right. like taking a child who's super high energy and very, very smart and saying, just sit there calmly. I'll give you M&Ms. That, that kid, that high energy, intense, bright child does not need mm -hmm. M&Ms. He needs to move. Right. He needs yes. to run. Yeah. So if you, if you end up with a child who's, you know, she's screaming and running it up, that's what she needs to do. Right. But if you do too much of it, then you get you can get stuck, right? So mm -hmm. then with dogs, I say to people, if it's an energetic dog that needs exercise, you must give it that exercise. I think it's almost cruel to try to keep a dog calm that has not had its needs met. So yes. you play fetch, do the fun things. But mm -hmm. watch your dog, watch your dog. Because if what you discover is that if you play a long time and you bring your dog in the house, it's worse, it's more mm -hmm. active, then you yes. have the opposite effect. Correct. And that's fine. Okay, now you know. So maybe uh, maybe you should play a shorter period of time. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you should play and then put your dog in a crate for half an hour to calm down. Does that help? So you experiment and you mm -hmm. learn about your dog. So I always yes. want to meet my dog's needs. And if my dog needs exercise, my dog needs exercise. But I don't mm -hmm. think you can exercise bad behavior out of the dog. I, I mean, it's just... <laughs> I, I agree with you. Yeah. So as a matter of fact, uh, you know, there have been a lot of cases that even we uh, come across where um, the pet parent says that, you know, uh, so of course, like uh, when there's a problem behavior or, you know, problem behavior in the sense, maybe the dog has, you know, jumped up on the couch and has started to destroy the furniture and the other, the cushions and what have you. Um, so we often ask in such a situation that what is the amount of uh, exercise, physical and mental, how much of it is he getting? So um, in quite, a, of course, in I would say about 80 to 85 percent of the cases, um, there's practically none. OK, but in those 15 percent cases, what happens is that the dog is going out for walk. Um, you know, the dog is has received his training. The dog, um, of course, but from what I probably think about it is maybe the dog has just gone for maybe a long one hour power walk. He's not really had the chance to explore, to sniff around, you know, to sort of get an idea about what's going on around the world uh, that he lives in. And obviously, when he comes home, all of that pent up mental energy just, you know, scatters all over. And um, unfortunately, that is deemed as bad behavior. Yeah, well, so, the mental and physical are totally different things. I mean, that's mm -hmm. truly they're not the same. And yes. so if I if I play a game of chess with you, that's yes. a completely different level of mental stimulation than if I go for a yes. run with you. They're both fantastic yes. and they're both mm -hmm. really important, but they are not the same. So me just running and running and running, if I don't have a chance yes. to use my need to interact, and the dog is the same. That's why we'll talk about that's nose work in a minute. Um, yes. So what I say to people in that circumstance, so the dog is in the house and has not had any exercise. And I said, well, what do you want the dog to do in the house? So you don't want mm -hmm. him to take things off your table. You don't want him to run around. You don't want him to mm -hmm. lunge at the windows. You don't want him to chase flies. You don't want him to chase his tail. What do you want? So really ask yourself in your house, what is available? And the person might say, well, I want him to chew on his toys. And I say, okay, you want your dog to chew on his toys for what? Hours? Like really? How many hours is your dog going to sit and chew on a toy? So what right. most of us offer our dogs in our homes is mm -hmm. nothing. Now, I'm not saying throw your dogs out the door in the morning. Like, you know, in the old days, not that long ago when I was a kid, you can't, not my family, but it's very normal that the dogs would go out in the morning and just, mm -hmm. you know, don't do that because it's not safe. Dog get hit by cars. Yes. But I will say at least the dog could do something. The dog could explore the neighborhood, could sniff. That's what they do. They wander around yes. and they and they check on what's been happening. In our homes, it's a little bit like a jail. So if you don't mm -hmm. provide something for that dog to do, and all you do is tell yes. me all the things you don't want. Don't run at the windows. Don't get on my couch. Don't you? Then I say, that's I, I hear all of that. 
Tell yes. me what you want. Three things. Name three things. And most people cannot name three desirable activities, mm -hmm. except for sleep. The first one is they want the dog to sleep. <laughs> I, to I cuddle. Mean, we do. Yes, I like that. But that yes. involves to human cuddle. interaction. That involves yeah. human interaction. So how much time are you, the human, willing to spend with your dog on your lap? So mm -hmm. the one thing that can shortcut a lot of this, because I agree, most of us don't have eight hours a day to entertain our dogs. And dogs do, yes. thankfully, mostly sleep a lot, mostly is um, nose work. And I know you and I had mm -hmm. a talk, chance to talk yes. about yes. So nose work, there's multiple ways to look at it. There's the simplistic mm -hmm. way, which is just nose, use your nose. Give the dog things like you can take uh, 10 kibbles, throw them around your house and tell the dog to find them. That is nose mm -hmm. work because the dog yes. is using their nose. But there's also a sport called nose work and it's a little bit more formal. And it's uh, mm -hmm. the closest I would explain it is like drug detection for pet dogs. So it's like oh, a wow. dog searching for drugs. It's the same sport, mm -hmm. right? Except that mm -hmm. instead of searching for drugs, maybe you have the dog search for um, a specific scent if you want to go mm -hmm. for a competition. Or, you know, I know a lot of pet people who never want to compete. They just have their dog search for like a tea bag. It doesn't matter yes. what your dog is taught to find. It's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you, you train your dog to search for a thing. And there's something about using the nose. And there's some wonderful research on this. It calms dogs down. So it's just like if yes. I play chess, I'm not moving, but I'm 100% locked in on an activity. I'm using all of my brain to solve a puzzle and a problem. And when I'm done, I'm tired. I'm satisfied. Yes. I've worked hard, but not my mm -hmm. body. When a yes. dog does a game like nose work, you can do nose work with a dog in a t an apartment, a very small space. It doesn't matter. It's not about physical movement. It's about mm -hmm. the challenge of using your nose. And for yes. a dog where I would do chess or a, a conversation like with you, for a dog using their nose has a very similar calming effect. And really mm -hmm. in 15 minutes of hiding things in your house, you will have a tired dog. More maybe even than taking your dog out for a 15 minute walk. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And yeah. if you can do both, your dog gets a oh. nice walk. And then has a rest at home. And then yes. maybe maybe you, I say the witching hour. So children mm -hmm. have it too. The, there's <laughs> yes. a time when dogs and children, uh, maybe after dinner, um, mm -hmm. they're bored. Yes. And you're, you're tired. And you just want to watch TV. <laughs> and your dog needs something. And nose work is a wonderful opportunity. You, if, you yes. just, if you don't want to take classes, you don't want to do anything formal, at the most simple level, let your dog search for their food. So if you feed your mm -hmm. dog a table that comes in a bag, uh, people will take the scoop. They will go out in the mm -hmm. backyard and throw it in the grass. The whole meal is in the grass. Like to me, the biggest waste I've ever heard of is putting your dog's food in a bowl. I mean, what a terrible a waste. Of a, what a waste of an opportunity. Dogs in the mm -hmm. wild don't walk along and then find a food bowl. They have to, they have mm -hmm. to put out energy and they have to search. So give them the opportunity to search. And yes. you could, you could, there's so many options out. There's puzzle toys you can buy where the dog works the food out of the toy. Um, my own mm -hmm. dogs don't eat kibble very much. They tend to eat food I make at home. But what I do is mm -hmm. I make the food, I put it in a food toy, I put it in my freezer, and then mm -hmm. I feed it to them frozen. And it takes my dogs, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes to, to mm -hmm. eat the whole thing, to get all the food out. So I just killed another 20 minutes, 30 minutes in my day. And my dog mm -hmm. was using their mouth, which they like. That also calms dogs. Eating and pulling yes. food calms them. Don't make the puzzle too hard. If the puzzle's too hard, it's frustrating. So if yes. your dog is agitated and whining, it's too much. Mm -hmm. But you yes. want to see the happy, contented dog succeeding. You yes. know. So nose work can be, you can make it complicated, like uh, go to competitions. You can do online competitions. Don't even have to leave your house. Or that's the, that's the, the, the sport approach. Mm -hmm. And you can do it with any dog. A chihuahua can do it. A beagle can do it. They, oh, yes. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be a German shepherd or it doesn't matter. You can right. use that skill to, uh, at the most simple level in your home, mm -hmm. searching mm -hmm. for not much. But if you become a, mm -hmm. a, 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 there's so many people who are dog trainers, but they don't know it. They're dog yes. trainers inside. Oh, yes. They just don't yes. know it yet. So oh, they, yes. think, they think they're pet people. No, you're, you're not a pet person because you're fascinated. No, you're not. You're fascinated yes. by dog behavior. So yes. anybody watching this program? So there's, uh, there's, 
Adultery. There's Priyanka Veer. Uh, she's one of our viewers. So Priyanka Veer, I'm going on record and I'm actually saying she is a dog trainer. She just does not know it. The amount of things that she does with her Pitbull Jordan. I mean, um, that's a dog that can do vaults. He can actually ricochet off of her chest. Really good at parkour. She's currently working on his handstand. He does know a little bit of, uh, you know, nose work and uh, advanced obedience, so on and so forth. And um, of course, you know, like even a, now say, for example, a dog like a pit bull, which is a fighting breed. So naturally, whenever, you know, that dog like orients and locks on towards another dog and, uh, you know, he's like, oh, OK, you're interesting. And then that is when probably whatever starts playing up in the brain. Um, at that point of time, as you said, that that arousal occurs and then the arousal, as you said, that from one to five, it could probably go at a very slow scale. But from five to ten, it can rock it off really quickly. So um, do you think that in such a situation, um, it's really important to build a relationship with your dog? Because a lot of times, um, you know, when uh, so this is completely unrelated to uh, Priyanka and her Pitbull Jordan. They are amazing. Yeah, they have a fantastic relationship. Uh, so the question that I was coming back to was that, do you think that it is important for the dog and the pet parent or the dog and the owner to have a functional relationship? Because a lot of times people are like, yeah, my dog knows a sit, my dog knows a down, my dog knows a stay. Um, but when he sees another dog, oh, all of that goes out of the window. Yeah. So the I, first uh, question, the first question I would ask in such a situation is, so how's your relationship with your dog? You know, yeah. so what what are your views about it? Well, it depends. You know, I can look back over my life and I can say I've been training dog sports for a long time, but I didn't have a good relationship with the first few dogs. Like I thought I did, mm -hmm. but I don't think the mm -hmm. dog did, partly because of how I trained. I wasn't particularly okay. kind. I'm much better now, but I didn't know. Um, so what I tell people, if you uh, if you have behavior issues that have to be worked mm -hmm. with, you mm -hmm. have to be on your dog's radar somewhere. Yes. In my house, I am pretty darn sure my dogs know where I am at all times, even when they're asleep. I think 1% of their brain is always aware of me, always a little teeny mm -hmm. tiny bit. And then when we go to train in my yard, serious training, I am 100% on the radar. I am the center of that radar. I am right. everything. And then when I go for a walk, I don't know, I'm probably between 10 and 50% on the radar. It just depends. Mm -hmm, maybe they're mm -hmm. sniffing, maybe they're sightseeing. The question is, if your dog is not on your radar at all, then you cannot influence their behavior when you need to. Yes. And if you're too much on the radar, if the dog is always looking at you, then they're not having a normal life. They're not exploring the world. Right. They're not taking in, the, they're not getting their needs met as an independent being. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so what I want is to be able to slide on a scale. I want to be always teeny tiny bit somewhere. And sometimes I want to be everything, you know, it's just mm -hmm. like a relationship with another person. I know if there's people in my house right now and mm -hmm. I kind of know what they're doing and where they are, but I don't need to be in the center. And then when we mm -hmm. have dinner together and we're talking and we're eating, it's a split. Yeah. So that's relationship right there. Yes. Yes. And then there's other time when it's 100%. I am engaged in a relationship, a discussion with another person. Mm -hmm. And all of those have value. All of those are part mm -hmm. of what builds your relationship with other people in your life. It's not just when you sit down and eat. It's not just when you have an intense conversation. Yes. And it's not just being. The problem is when there's no awareness at all. There's no, yes. uh, you take your dog out. And I tell people, I'm I, I love choice. I love letting dogs choose. But I also love structure. And structure mm -hmm. comes up when I think there might be a bad choice. So what I say about choice, always give choice if there's no wrong choice. So yes. if I tell a dog to sit and he lays down, I really don't care. Nothing bad is mm -hmm. going to happen. I just train it better. But if I walk by a fence and I don't know if my dog is going to lunge at the dog behind the fence, that is not an acceptable choice. So yep. I must structure the dog. That's Then choice mm -hmm. is no longer an option. But you cannot structure a dog if you don't have a relationship because the dog doesn't care about you. He makes his own choices. Yes. So the more Correct. relationship you have, the more you can step up when you know that that needs to happen. And sometimes I, just, I have information the dog doesn't have. I know yes. that that's going to go badly. So I'm going to tell my dog, hey, right now, and this is where training is so nice, I need you mm -hmm. to come back to heel and I need you to look at me because I know that if you look in that direction at that dog, he's going to start screaming and then everything's going to go bad. 
Mm -hmm. So that's where like all that training you talk about with your friend, with her pit bull, with Jordan and her pit mm -hmm. bull, if she is going to have an issue, the more training she's done, one, the quicker the dog is likely to say, you tend to know things and you've been in my best interest in the past. So mm -hmm. I think I'll listen to you, right? That, if the dog yes. has not found you to be useful, then the dog is yeah. not going to listen to you. That's why I tell people, Absolutely. if you take your dog for a walk and you let other dogs attack your dog routinely, why? <laughs> yes. Would the dog Would listen? You, to and people absolutely. say, it's not my fault the dog was off leash. And I say, I agree 100%. How many times has it happened? If it's happened three times in the same neighborhood, then the question has to be, then why do you keep walking in that neighborhood? You absolutely. must make good choices for your dog. And if absolutely. you cannot make those good choices, then your dog will stop listening to you because you don't have value. Dogs absolutely. Yes. Give to people who show value. And I saw it the other day with my puppy. We were in a new situation and I saw him look to me quickly mm -hmm. to see how we were supposed to behave. Because he has learned that over time I have good information. And so mm -hmm. when I encounter people on the trails, uh, cause I'm working on his people behavior, he's a little not too friendly yet. I chat mm -hmm. with the people, I chat with everybody. They must think there's something wrong with me. I talk to everyone. Through the parking lot. Good morning. Hello. Hi. How are you? Oh, that's. <laughs> and I do that because it shows my dog normal mm -hmm. sociable behavior. Yes. And that causes my dog to say, "Must be good. Must be nice. Everything is good." Not not the first day, but after I've done it five hundred times, if there's something odd in the world that I'm not comfortable, and I don't say good morning, and my behavior changes a little bit. And my dog feels there's something abnormal about this situation. And the dog looks at me and I'm acting odd. Now the dog knows mm, mom is not comfortable right now. Something mm -hmm. is different. Here. And yet yes. if I suddenly realize I look at the person and I realize they're fine, it was just a moment. It was something off that happens. And mm -hmm. I said to my dog, Oh, good morning. And then my dog says, Oh, it's, it's good. So that's where relationship really comes to play. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. The dog learns that you are a valuable resource, which is hopefully how children yes. look at their human parents, right? So when the mm -hmm. human parent takes the child somewhere like to the zoo and the child is scared of the animals and the, and the parent says, no, 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 it's okay. There's a fence. See, it's okay. And over time, it's safe. But if the parent takes the child to the zoo and the animals keep getting out and attacking, well, then the third yes. time it happens, the child says to the parent, you know, I have not found you to be very trustworthy. So that's true. On this occasion, if I can get away from you, I am. And I'm going to either run yes. away or I'm going to try to attack, depending on circumstances, because you've Correct. not helped me. So I, I put a huge amount. I tell people accidents happen. Nobody can predict everything all the time. And sometimes you're going to go somewhere and a bad thing is going mm -hmm. to happen. And hopefully you have a resilient dog. Yes. But you really, if bad things keep happening, you absolutely need to do some reflection and yes. ask yourself why. Like when somebody says their dog gets attacked all the time, that something is wrong with that picture. How absolutely. many times? Like what? Why can't you change? And they say, well, in my neighborhood, the dogs are loose. Then I said, then get in the car and drive. Mm -hmm. And they say, I don't have a car and the dogs are loose. Then fine. Exercise your dog in your house. But you cannot mm -hmm. keep putting your dog in a circumstance where bad things Correct. are going to happen. You have to Correct. make some um, Yes. Well, you know, I totally echo with you. In fact, uh, there are a lot of times where, um, you know, the owner's voice becomes uh, or rather the owner calling out to the dog or everything. It becomes absolute white noise because sometimes it's also overdone. Um, in fact, there's a very popular internet meme where there's a rather, you know, happy-go-lucky looking dog and um, the, the caption reads, hi, my name is come here. I'm also sometimes known as no. <laughs> or I think, hi, my name is no. I'm also known as come here. Uh, you know, uh, so I was also thinking, you know, when you, you were talking about this, a lot of times, even in two dog households or multiple dog households, um, don't you think that there is, uh, of course, there's this... Uh, very popular belief since a very long time that yes i've got one dog and uh, now i'm going to get a second dog to um you know keep my first dog company and most often than not what happens is that uh, people fail to realize that well two dogs equals to twice the work or maybe thrice the work and but what happens instead is that we um look at it as a premise to let the dogs bond with each other 
and eventually when the two dogs are together the owner is probably as insignificant as a fly on the wall um so you know could you probably uh, give uh, a couple of tips to uh, you know uh, pet owners and uh, pet parents that you know have multiple dogs in their household yeah so there's so much in there i do think people need to take a hard look at themselves and ask why they have dogs so <laughs> People have dogs for a lot of reasons and I'm not even making yes. a judgment. I'm just saying people have dogs for a lot of reasons. I yes. do think there are people out there who have dogs to watch them play with other dogs. It's a genuine, they love that. They want to watch that. They want their dogs to bond and they're actually happy to be hands off and observe. Mm -hmm. That's not my choice, but it's not, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just not my mm -hmm. choice. Right. But if you want, so what I try to tell, I tell people, get on the five-year plan. And what I mean is get a dog every five years. Because mm -hmm. by the time a dog is five years old, it's your dog. It, it, if you yes. have been training it and working with it, it loves you the most. Yes. Then when you bring in a puppy, that, that should work out. Because the adult dog would really prefer you, but hopefully we'll play with your puppy a little. So Because it does take some stress off your plate. Is that That's right. one thing I don't have. My adult dogs will not play with my puppy, and I wish they would. Because it would mm -hmm. kill time. And it would exercise them, yeah, a little bit. Yes. But what if you want your second dog to love you the way your first dog does? Well, mm -hmm. now you better start thinking. Because if you don't take the puppy alone with you and make yourself valuable, the dogs are going to bond to each other. Mm -hmm. It's a choice. It's just a choice. Everybody needs time with you if that is something you want long term. Right. Uh, here's how you can you know, tell people, when I open the door, and a new person is coming in. I look at the dogs around me and I look to see where they look. So yeah. if the dog looks at me as I open the door, the dog is looking for me for information about the new person. If the dog looks at another dog, when the door opens, that tells me right there. Yes. Where does that dog take its leadership? Is it from you mm -hmm. or is it from the other dogs? And I don't mean leadership in the dominance way. It's not. I'm not using it in the bad word day. I'm using it in the sense that Dogs, everybody, humans too. Children look mm -hmm. to their parents for leadership. What I'm talking about is guidance and yes. information. I'm not talking about yes. anything else. At the front door, when there's an uncertain moment, I know who looks where for guidance. I want my dogs to look to me for guidance, Correct. not yes. to each other. Maybe yes. someone else has a different perspective. Now, the other thing about arousal, one plus one does not equal two. If you have one dog who walks nicely on a leash and you can manage it, and you have a second dog who walks nicely on a leash and you can manage it, you put those two dogs together and it's like nobody has ever had any training in their lives because they feed mm -hmm. on each other and the energy goes yes. up, 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 up. And I tell people, you must get each dog individually good first. That's really yes. important. Now you bring the two dogs together and you work with them in super calm, low arousal situations so that they can learn to take the skill they have independently together. But people don't yes. want to take that time. So what usually happens, they get a new dog, they bring it out with the other dog. Now the puppy mm -hmm. just looks to the other dog the whole time, gets more and more agitated and excited. Now the older dog starts getting agitated. And as far yes. as I can tell, dogs only teach each other bad habits. They don't teach good things, right? So <laughs> it's, it's true, yeah? I mean, it's like, they teach each other to bark, to lunge. Mm -hmm. How come they don't teach each other to just be calm? They don't say they don't teach that. They don't yeah. get a dog and expect to teach a dog good things. Yeah, I mean, also, I think it eventually even boils down to the criteria that we want with our dogs, right? I mean, uh, so, uh, yes, I, I completely echo what you're saying. Um, so, Denise, what we're going to do is we're just going to take a couple of uh, questions from our viewers. Sure. Um, so we have uh, Bunty Minocha, uh, forgive me if I got the surname wrong, but uh, what he says is that under this COVID-19 situation, uh, my dog got 24. Okay, so I'm just going to, uh, Bunty, if you're watching, uh, please um, correct me if uh, I've misinterpreted your question. But what Bunty says is, under this COVID-19 situation, um, I have got my dog with me for 24 hours and now I feel it's a problem as he has become overprotective of me. Hmm. Um, yeah. I think, yeah. So, so it can happen. COVID has had some very interesting effects on dogs. Some of them are very good, by the way. They're not all bad, mm -hmm. um, yeah. but it has changed things. 
And one thing mm -hmm. I think is super helpful, if, if you have to go back to a normal life, like you're not going to be working at home all the time, then even if you don't need it, you must make opportunities to separate from your dog. So right. you, uh, with my puppy, he's been, since he came, I work from home, I'm home a lot. And there's always somebody here. Mm -hmm. uh, I still choose to crate him for mm -hmm. about usually two hours at a time, two to three times a day alone. Even though mm -hmm. there's people around, there's no reason to do it. And that's why I'm doing it because I don't want to have problems with separation, anxiety, or issues. So I think the easiest thing to do is to start, if you have a crate and you crate your dog, to start crating him away from you for short periods of time right. so that he stops becoming so uh, dependent on that yes. constant. If when you say overprotective, you mean aggressive? then I would suggest you contact a trainer because I yes. wouldn't be very comfortable giving advice without seeing Absolutely. A yes, um, and also the information, the, the input that's been given is a little bit limited. So Bunty, yeah. um, what we would, uh, what we would uh, humbly suggest is that please get in touch with uh, your local trainer or behaviorist that is in your locality or in your vicinity um, as uh, they will probably be at a much better position to help you out with more information from your end. Um, so we're going to take our next question. It is Kirti Tripathi. Um, Kirti asks, how does one increase focus with an over aroused dog in a new area? That's a great question. You separate those two issues. So you mm -hmm. keep the focus games when there's low arousal. Mm -hmm. So for example, in your yeah. house, I see you say puppy or whatever, whatever you say, and you give him 10 cookies for nothing. Now you yep. go to your front door, puppy, 10 cookies for nothing. Now you open your front door. Now you walk safely on leash to the car, puppy, and you do it. So you slowly increase it before there's arousal. Mm -hmm. Now you take your dog somewhere, you get a teeny bit of arousal, and don't wait till your dog is out of control. When your dog's mm -hmm. just a little bit, I say, ears up. Once I start hearing that panting sound, that's my cue for my dog. Right. I have to right. stop that. Out comes the food. I put my dog in a down. I throw a handful of food between his feet. Yeah. Calms him right down. He's not focusing on me because that's not what I need, but that would be a fine way to do it. If you want to go further, then instead of just feeding on puppy, ask for a mm -hmm. uh, focused type cue. So for example, sit with yes. cookie man would be, uh, so then it's sit, dog looks at you in your house, cookie, cookie, cookie. Mm -hmm. Sit and looks at you at the front door, cookie, cookie, cookie. Sit on your front lawn, cookie is the same. Slowly put those two together. Now what happens is you go to a new area, you say your dog's name, and they look to you out of habit, if nothing else. My dog's clip broke the other day on my trail. So we're zooming along and it popped, and away he went down the trail, and there was a dog. Oh. And I, exactly, it was not a good moment. And I kind of had that little panic, like, oh, that's not good thing. And I said his name, mm -hmm. and he came back so fast. Habit. He was yes. habit. It didn't even occur to him not to just turn around and run right back well, I was very grateful but yeah. that's how you get focus or control don't and Absolutely. Don't, don't rely on that too much like i fixed yeah. my clip i'm not gonna you know and i'm on notice yeah i'm on notice now yes. maybe i should put two leashes if i'm in a situation mm -hmm. that i have a concern because yes. i don't want to have my dog hurt Absolutely. So, you know, it's it's uh, very nice that when you bring it, when you when you said the word habit, it just, uh, you know, uh, brought up a quote in my mind. So habit, um, habit remains. You remove the H, a bit remains. You remove the A, bit remains. You remove the B, it remains. Right. So that's why they say habit remains. So I think, Denise, that's fantastic. Um, you know, Denise, uh, just out of curiosity, this is a personal question of mine before we go along. You know, they speak about what we call a habit loop for human beings, which is around 21 days. Would you probably happen to have an idea about um, a habit loop? Uh, how long would it take for a dog to have a habit loop? That's such an interesting question. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Uh, what I do say is mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of management. And when I say management, mm -hmm. what I mean is the development of good habits by preventing bad ones. So mm -hmm. it's not that I'm setting a good habit. I'm just stopping bad things. Like, so for example, right. I don't want my dogs on my counters. So they're never on my counters. It's inevitable that I will remove you if I see you on my mm -hmm. counters. And I hate to say it's not 21 days. So for me, I would say it's the first year of my dog's life is a mm -hmm. lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's nonstop. 
because I know how important it is not to let the bad habits start. Mm -hmm. So if I prevent all the bad things, the chasing, the digging and all, and some dogs make this easy and some dogs do not make this easy. Um, if I can right. get through one year, maybe even two years, right? Because they're still lively. Then I have mm -hmm. the rest of the dog's life with a really nice companion. Now right. I can change a given behavior in a very short period of time. Like I could teach my dog to sit very quickly or to look at me. And generally, so my school teaches classes of um, usually six weeks and the difference is enormous. Like usually at the beginning of a class on focus, for example, and then at the end after six weeks, it's almost like not the same dog. So you can change behavior. But whether right. or not I would say it's habit, like whether or not the dog doesn't even know an alternative, long time, it's a long time. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So um, I think we're just going to quickly uh, hop over to um, another question. Um, so Priyanka has, uh, so Priyanka again with Jordan, she has a question. Sometimes I can't make out when I've overworked my dog. Tara, her German shepherd, stops playing when she is tired, but Jordan, the pit bull, continues to try and impress. And oh. the next day he's he's limping yeah. and he has stiffness. So um, any signs that I can identify, uh, this is only when playing. When training, he's quick to tell that he's quick to tell when the brain is fried. So that's a very typical pit bull. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because mm -hmm. historically, the working breeds to do the job had to stay in the game when the going got hard. So mm -hmm. what kind of a terrier comes out of the hole because the rat fights back, yeah? Even though the rat maybe scratches the face and such. Yeah. The reality of working dogs, working breeds, the pit bulls, the herding dogs, you cannot trust them to make good decisions mm -hmm. for themselves. They will drop a heat stroke before they will stop the movement. Oh, yes. You know? And so really, I think your best thing is just to time it. So if you mm -hmm. go out and you play hard for 20 minutes and the next day your dog is a mess, give him some drugs to get through it, make a mental note the next day, 15 minutes. See how that goes, right. 10 minutes, you know? Uh, because I, I have, you know, I see this a lot. These um, hard working dogs do not have good yes. self preservation And I think whether we call it this or not, we have inadvertently bred in uh, what we call OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Oh, yes. Because there's nothing normal about a dog persisting past the point of being able to walk, and I've seen it, yes. uh, where the dog is wobbling because he's uh, he's he's so he's he's gone so long, his temperature is so high, and the dog won't stop, right? Yes. Um, and we take advantage of that because it allows us to put our dogs in situations uh, which are right. tough, which are hard, uh, and so I think. Unfortunately, I don't think there's anything you can do besides set a clock because your dog will hide it the same way a child who's very sick with 100, uh, 103 degree temperature. I'm fine. I want to go to the birthday party, right? He's, he's <laughs> vomiting. He's sweating. He can barely get out of bed, but he's dragging himself to the door. I want to go to the party. I want to go to the party. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and dogs are the same. They, and we just have to say, you know, I know you think you do. I don't think you do. You might also find that certain types of play are much worse. So with my old dog, when she's not here anymore, but when my old dog got old, she lived to be 15, she still had very good energy. Uh, and she still wanted to play tug. So what I learned is tug was fine. That did not make her mm -hmm. sore and tired, but no fetch. The fetching, the turning, the trying to run, the explosive speed just did not work for her as she got older. So uh, we switched uh, activities. And that okay. is, is really, um, I found fetch was fine. Um, some swimming was fine, but not jumping. So there's just, you might just have to, sadly, you might have to limit just your dog. Time, yeah, you just might have to time it a bit. Yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, Mira Thosar has a question. So today someone asked me how to know if the dog really loves you or not. As a trainer, what are key points for the owners to know if the dog really loves, respects, and uh, so in brackets, respects and trusts you? I'm actually glad you defined it because what is love? How do I know that my husband loves me? How do I know mm -hmm. that my children love me? Do children love us or do they just need us? I mean, 
they're pretty selfish little bits, right? Children, <laughs> small, small children. They're, they're very much me, 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 me. Yeah. I, I mean, oh, yeah. so what is love is a really complicated um, question. I, I guess my best definition is because how do I know if a person wants to be with me? That's it right there. Does the dog want to be around you? That's mm. it to me. Does the dog want to spend time where I'm at? And I'm not talking about food and toys. Yes, if I have food right. and toys, I can get your dog to spend time with me. Does that mean your dog loves me? No, it means I have food and toys. To me, relationship is what's left when the food and toys are gone. Mm -hmm. When there's no food and there's no toys, does the dog choose to spend time with me? When they're getting yes. nothing concrete. If they do, and I find that as my dogs grow with me, they spend time with me. If you come to my house and you have food and toys, they'll leave me. But when the food and toys are gone, where does the dog go? The dog right. comes back to me. And when I, because I do working sports, I do competition. When there's no food in the ring, there's no toys in the ring, my dogs know that. Do they stay with me anyway? Do they do it anyway? They do. It's they do it for many reasons. One habit, it's just what we do. We just do these things together. Right. I don't think they ask the questions. I think they just mm -hmm. do the things, you know? Um, and I remember the day one of my dogs figured out there would be no food and toys in the ring. I could tell. I saw her, I saw some things that happened. And I saw her look where she knows the food and the toys are on her crate. And I saw her do the work anyway for me after that. There was a change. Mm -hmm. There was a slight, there was a drop in her energy, but she didn't ever stop working for me because it's what we do. Um, so right. I think what I tell people is, does your dog want to be with you? Does your dog look to you when they're unsure? That tells me that you have leadership. When the dog doesn't know what right. to do, do they take it upon themselves to figure it out or do they check to see if you have some input? That tells me a mm. lot about relationships. Right. I love, I'm not saying if a dog doesn't look to the handler that it's terrible. I'm just saying if I see a dog look to the handler, I know that handler put work into that dog and that right. dog knows they can rely on the handler. But the yes. opposite is not true. If a dog doesn't look to the handler, it doesn't mean that there's not a relationship because it could just be a very independent dog. It could be a very mm -hmm. high arousal situation. If you take a border collie and it stares at the sheep, it doesn't mean it doesn't uh, respect, love, uh, engage with the handler. Mm -hmm. It just means the sheep are very powerful. Right. But I, it, absolutely. The other, I don't see dogs look to the handler when the handler does not add value. Mm -hmm. So True. it's easier that, for me that, to that, define. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's much easier yes. for me to say I see a lovely relationship. It's very hard for me to say I don't see a relationship because that's just, it's mm -hmm. complicated and there's circumstances. True. I get asked this all the time and then people get themselves all upset over nothing. I'm like, look, I can't look at what's happening here and say anything. It's a, it's a one moment in time. Mm -hmm. Eventually you decide, is it a good relationship to you? Are you happy? Is your dog happy? Are you both getting your needs met? I think that's enough. Yes. Yeah, I, I think I think um, you know. So a lot of times, uh, people have that expectation that my dog should cuddle with me on command, uh, if you must. So um, I was like, well, I don't know anything about on command or not, but you know what? It's a relationship. It's a two-way street. So if you want your dog to even want to cuddle with you, first of all, dogs are not cuddlers. Um, by nature, I mean, at least it's not their primary nature. They might kind of grow to like it later on. Um, but well, you have to first give it something to get something in return, right? Like that's how that's how I think all the relationships work, where you have to first give a little, and that's when you get a little, and then well, you build on that, you know. Um, all right, so I think that that was great. That was great, uh, Denise, Mira. I hope um, that answered your question. Uh, we're gonna move on to Mona Lisa Banerjee. A lot of dogs have a, a lot. So, so, I'm so sorry. A lot of people have become new pet parents in the lockdown. What would be your relationship to them as they start out in building a relationship with their dogs? Well, they have a huge advantage. If you think oh, yeah. about it, under the COVID situation, other people are not likely to walk up anymore and play with your dog. So, mm -hmm. and there's much less dog interactions too, for the same reason, because you go in public with your adorable little puppy, all furry. Yes. And people from a distance say, oh, that's a lovely puppy. Now, I don't know what your culture is like in India, but in mm -hmm. the United States, dogs are almost perceived as community property when they're young. And so people will run up and have their hands all over your dog. They yes. don't even know you. I think, my God, 
do you run up and do that to my husband? Do you run up and do that to my <laughs> children? Like, it's, yes. it's, I find it odd, but it is, it's our culture. And so you live with your culture. It, it happens in India very okay. much as well. Just probably I'm not, not a, in the I'm not a fan. I do not like this for a lot of reasons. I don't like it for shy dogs because it's scary and overwhelming. Yes. I don't like it for highly sociable dogs because it makes them hyper greeters. It teaches them mm -hmm. that every person is their new best friend. It's cute when a 10 pound la la Labrador puppy climbs on your head. It's not yes. cute when an 80 pound Labrador nine month old climbs on your head. And yet the puppy doesn't know what happened. It doesn't understand it's not tiny. It just got bigger. Yeah. It's so now you teach hyper graders to be more hyper and you teach shy dogs to be more shy because people don't respect their space. Yes. The middle dogs, they do fine no matter what. The, those middle dogs are always fine. Mm -hmm. So I actually think it's going to be easier because the dog learns that its primary engagement is with the handler, not with the world and the people in the world. Yes, um, It's been, I, I think, a, a simpler time in that respect. But you do have to socialize dogs. So what I mm -hmm. suggest is dogs do not need to interact to become acclimated and comfortable. So I'm kind mm -hmm. of a fan. I wrote an article about this recently. I take the dog in the car, in the crate. I drive somewhere. I open the back of the car. And I let them watch. You go to the grocery store. You park your mm -hmm. car so the dog can see. And you just let the dog sit in the car with the window down and watch the people. Listen to the carts, the shopping carts. Maybe you go to a school where there's kids outside. They don't need to be a participant. They just need to see it. And then... Right. The dog, and then if the dog is nervous, you just let them stay in the car. If the dog is confident, you let them out right in front of your car to, to watch mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. maybe to walk. But you let the dog decide wh when it's ready to go. And so then anytime I leave my house to go to the post office, the library, the shopping, uh, anything, I take the dog. And then what I do when I get there depends. So I might leave the dog mm -hmm. in the car. It just depends on... Um, like if I went to the grocery store, I would take the dog out and we would be mm -hmm. wear a mask and nobody would come near. Everybody would wear a mask and stay away. I spend five minutes walking the dog about the area, then back in the car. Then I go and do my shopping, come back out because the dog got a break. I do one more pass and then we mm -hmm. go home. So it's very right. efficient for my time. And it's everything the puppy needs and the people stay away from me. You know, they we talk, they'll say hello and we can be social, but um, they don't come over and they often yeah. say, Oh, I wish I could pet your puppy. And I'm like, I know. And inside I'm thinking, I'm so glad you can't. <laughs> yeah, in, in, your, in your mind, you're probably like, how about no? <laughs> yes. And what's really nice now, my puppy, he's seven months old, but he's 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to pet him anymore. So it's perfect. It's now time has solved my problem because he's not cute right. and woolly. He's a dog. So by the time True. lockdown ends, people won't be running over anymore because he's True. a dog. True. Um, True. So True. I actually think relationships are going to be better. And I think people are going to blame every bad behavior on COVID. And my inclination is to do the opposite. I'm saying every yes. good thing is a result. And probably the truth lies in the middle. But I, yes. I, I don't think it's going to be the hell that people think it's going to be. I think dogs are going to do fine. Yes. As a matter of fact, you know, in this entire COVID situation, so um, which quickly brings me to uh, hi, Rana. So Rana has asked that question for both. Do you guys offer any online courses or subscriptions? Before we answer that, I think uh, the advantage that we've had with COVID, and um, so I had actually done a live stream regarding the very same topic, online dog training. Um, I think COVID will actually help in, um, you know, pet parents achieve a better relationship and a much better trainability of the puppy simply because of the fact that with online dog training, because uh, a lot of people might still be uncomfortable for an outsider to come home, you know, and an outsider being the trainer. So I think in, in online training, what happens is that a lot of accountability of the training falls upon the shoulders of the pet parents. So I agree with you when, uh, you know, we say that uh, the COVID-19 situation might actually help in better behaved dogs. And of course, uh, dogs having a much better relationship um, with uh, their pet parents. So coming to Rana's question again, um, do you guys offer any online courses and sessions? So Denise, I'll let you lead with this. Yeah, um, 
I own Fancy Dog Sports Academy, which may well be one of the, it's almost certainly one of the largest online schools in the world. Uh, we wow. have thousands of students every term. So it's a big school mm -hmm. and it's only 70% US. So it's very international. Mm -hmm. um, Lovely. We have a term starting October 1st. We started registration three days ago. So right now is when you register. Instruction mm -hmm. will start on the 1st and we offer like 40 classes. So there is something mm -hmm. for everyone. We also have self-study. And next month we're starting a brand new program called PetDogTrainingOnline.com. And that program will be made up of like 30 videos on demand. So you can just purchase the topic, like counter surfing, the topic you need. And it's actually great for professional dog trainers because they could send their, their students there and then work with them individually on their own. Um, so that's a really nice way to get started on your dog's behaviors. Like we'll have a puppy pack to help people with housebreaking and all, but that's not available until next month. Right now is the six week classes and our focus is very much on dog sports. So um, we do offer other classes. We have an introduction to nose work class. So if people are specifically interested in nose work and learning about nose work, um, we can help you with that. I suspect my host has, um, had an internet problem and eh, you know, maybe he'll come back in a minute. Maybe we'll just chat, you know, we'll just do this on our own. We don't even need a host here. Wait, Ollie, I'm going to check the comments. Maybe I can find a comment and just start answering it. This is going to be fun. Maybe I'll just take over the show. What do you think? Um, so Mona Lisa says it's very similar in India. I wonder if I can even put them on the screen. Oh, I've got a whole new career ahead of me. No. So the question is, I don't have that much power. So, ah, oh, the power guy is back. I'll let him take <laughs> it. I was doing great without you. Let me tell you, oh. I was just running with it. I, I was going to answer the questions. <laughs> oh, please. Of course. Of course. Um, so sorry. I actually had uh, my internet breakdown. So um, I think we've resolved that situation. Um, so, uh, so I, I think Denise, carry on, please. I'm so sorry. I'm so no, sorry. I, to, I was ready to go to new questions. <laughs> ah, lovely. Okay. So yes, Rana, I'm back. Yes, sit does happen. Um, so I, we're just gonna quickly uh, move on to um, Bunty Minocha again. My boy Arjun. I'm guessing Arjun is your dog's name. Is a pit bull and has bitten my family members in anxiety. It started basically when he wanted attention or love from them. Attention was given, but it turned into biting. What can we do? So mm. there's some stuff in here which is complicated and potentially contradictory. So what I'm going to say, it makes me really nervous to talk about aggression if I'm not looking at the dog. But once mm -hmm. you've had a bite, and I don't know if it's mm -hmm. mouthing or biting. So... Um, Mouth on does not, to me, mean biting, right? Mm -hmm. Mouth on can be my young dog uh, holds my whole arm like this in his hand, in his mouth. He does it because he's an oral dog. It's not a bite. Mm -hmm. uh, but other people would find it scary, right, and might call it biting. I don't. So just reading this question, with, with so mm -hmm. many questions in my own mind, what I would suggest is contacting a trainer because what a trainer is going to do is take a really thorough history and maybe come to your house or videotape or whatever and get a lot more information because once a dog is biting, the, the stakes are high, right? So there's so yes. much risk and I don't, what if I give you advice and it's bad advice because I'm not looking at it and then what if your dog ends up having to be put to sleep, right? So, or somebody mm -hmm. gets seriously hurt. So rather than giving advice and being very sorry, I would like mm -hmm. to suggest that you get some professional help. And it might even be a simple thing. You know, it might be one time somebody comes in, looks at the situation, says, oh, no, no, this is actually not nearly what you think it is, and cleans it right up. Mm -hmm. Or maybe a person comes in and says, you know, this is kind of serious, and let's spend some time fixing this up. And I think that would be right. more responsible than any kind of real specific help for you. Right, right. I, I, think, that's, I think that's sound advice, you know. So, Bunty, again, um, you know, we're going to, we're just going to say it again that please just reach out to um, a trainer and a behaviorist in your vicinity, um, you know, who, as Denise also rightly said, will uh, be able to go with you into the history of your dog's behaviors ever since he's come home. Um, 
figure out why a dog is biting, why he's doing what he's doing, and then probably help you in um, resolving that situation. Um, so a quick question by Pranita Balar. Could you please give tips to pet parents to understand when their pet is being reactive and get help? Well, reactive is an interesting word because it just means to react. So different people have different opinions about when mm -hmm. reactivity is a problem. So what I say is when the behavior becomes a problem, either for the dog, the handler or society, that is when you get help. But let's right. say, let's say you have a 10 pound dog who doesn't like other dogs. And he only encounters a few dogs and the other dogs are at a great distance and the dog acts the fool, right? Just up in arms. And the other dogs don't care and the handler doesn't care and people think it's whatever. If it's not really causing a problem and it's not making the dog worse and it's not agitating the dog about going on a walk, does the dog need help? I don't know. I mean, how do you decide? To me, it's when one of those three players is struggling. Society isn't mm -hmm. having a good, like if my dog, if I walk my dog and he lunges at people, let's say I don't care. I do, but let's just say I don't care. And let's say my dog finds it entertaining. How does society feel about that? Probably not very good, so I need to get help. What yeah. if I take my dog out and society doesn't care? They know my dog is on a leash. My dog is having a fine time, but I care Then I need to get help. What if I don't right. care because I'm just one of those people who thinks that's kind of cool? I'm not. What if society's mellow? But what if the dog is becoming anxious and stressed every time it goes on a walk? then you need to get help. But I don't think a problem is a problem until one of those three parties is suffering. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have a small dog. My small dog is allowed to walk on my desk. He does this because he jumps up on the chair, on the table, and then he gets in my lap that way. I've had people mm -hmm. appalled at this behavior. They think I should stop that. Why? I don't care. The dog is happy. Society is not harmed. So yeah. always go back to do they need help? And then I put it in those terms. I say, let's say the reason you believe they need help is because you think the dog is struggling or the dog is causing, causing problems for you on your walk. Those are the terms I put it in. And mm -hmm. because I don't like to put it on me, instead of saying your dog is scaring me, although I will say that, that's very powerful. If you're walking and another person's dog is behaving badly, and you, and you move away and you say, I'm sorry, that just makes me scared and nervous. Uh, sometimes dogs break their collar. What you have mm -hmm. said to the person is, you may not care about the behavior. Your dog might even find it entertaining, but you're scaring me. And people don't want to scare other people. Not when you say it nicely, when you yell at them, damn it, do something about your dog, get them under control. That just brings out defensiveness, you know? Yes. So I, I like to think in terms of those three parties, those three players all have rights. And if any one of the three's rights are being impinged upon at mm -hmm. a level that is beyond normal tolerance, then it needs to be addressed. And I also see the reverse. I think society needs to learn to give a little. So let's say you're working with your reactive dog and you make a little mistake and the dog acts a little bit badly. I think society needs to get in the habit of saying, hey, it's just like a baby on an airplane who cries. Give a little. It's okay. It happens. You know, apologize for your dog's behavior. Yes. And I think sometimes a dog, maybe the dog wants to pull on the leash, but society doesn't like that. It's scared. And maybe the handler is uncomfortable. Then the dog has to give a little. The dog is going to learn to walk on a loose leash, even if he doesn't mm -hmm. walk. And I think handlers sometimes need to give a little. So maybe they don't care right. sitting in the house. The dog barks hysterically for an hour straight. They just don't hear yes. it. Maybe the yeah. neighbor cares. So all the parties need to learn to be flexible and kind. Correct. And yes. all the parties have rights. So I say everybody has rights. Everybody has responsibilities. Mm -hmm. How can we find a solution which is most palatable to all the players? And I like that yeah. way of thinking because I think it keeps us in balance. You know, I'm not all about, oh, it's all about the dog. Oh, gee, the dog doesn't like to be trained nicely. So I let him pull. He broke my arm because I fell. That's not okay. That's not okay. Yeah. But should the dog pay the price all the time because you didn't train him? No. Mm. So that's how I look at it. Absolutely. I think I think um, the essence behind the entire um, 
situation is that uh, I read this somewhere, I can't recall where, but it, it was very beautifully said where they said, train proactively, not reactively. So I think I think when uh, you know we achieve that, we often are calm ourselves, our dogs are calm, and uh, you know it's a good day. It's a good day. You actually um, reminded just, uh, me of something really quick that I was thinking about the other uh -huh. day. This is one of the big trainers between differences between a trainer and a pet person. A trainer right. sees something and says to themselves, "If I let that continue, it's going to escalate and get worse." Mm -hmm. And a pet person doesn't see it until it's a problem. A big one. yes. Because we yes. just, we know the chain of events. Mm -hmm. So the first time your dog jumps up, knocks something out of your hand and eats it on the floor, a trainer looks at that and says, uh, uh, I got to deal with that. Or the dog's going to be intentionally smashing into me and causing me to drop things. A pet person mm -hmm. does not realize how impactful it was that they dropped the cookie at the moment the dog bumped into them. Yes. So three months has gone by and now the dog is shaking them down, like <laughs> using aggression or yeah. intentionally bashing into them and now people get scared. The yes. person gets scared, now the dog sees that their behavior is driving the other and now you have what actually turns into aggression when there was none. Um, yes. Anyway, that was just a random thought I had uh, recently. No, I, I think I think I think that that's uh, so true, you know, and it holds true in a load of uh, real time uh, situations that I think all of us have come across at one point or the other. We're quickly just gonna uh, go over just uh, probably the last two questions for the night. Aishwarya Vijaya Dharan um, asks, "What is the best way to work with reactive dogs that aren't food or toy motivated?" even when they're trained in calm in calmer environments, but it just does not translate outside in any new environment. So one of the classes at my online school is uh, taught by Amy Cook, Dr. Amy Cook, and she is a sort of behavior person. And she does something called the play way. So you might want mm -hmm. to go online and do some research. She does not use food or toys. She uses personal play and interaction to change reactive behavior. It's uh, okay. new, it's interesting, it's effective. And I have absolutely incorporated aspects of that choice. So you might want to investigate that because it's perfect for what sure. you're describing. Right, excellent. Um, so again, I think Mona Lisa has another question. What is the best way to socialize a small dog to be comfortable around other larger dogs? There is ex either extreme discomfort on the leash or um, an exhibition of attempt to dominate. How do you train them to be calm with other dogs? So there's a few pieces. Um, one is nothing bad can ever happen. So if your small dog is taken to a place with big dogs and the big dog is spitting and slobbering and barking and smashing it with their paws, all friendly, totally friendly, but scary and overwhelming, then the dog will not trust. And so then it's over, right, right there. So the number one most important thing is that nothing bad can happen in those situations. And my definition of bad is not just physical harm, it's mental harm. So for example, if a dog is in a crate and every time I walk by, the dog hits the front of the crate and screams, right? That's frightening to me, it's scary. Now, I'm an adult human being who understands how crates work and I understand the dog is locked in, but how could my dog know that? So if I have a small dog walking past the crate and it hears that, it doesn't know the dog can't get out of that crate. So number one is that nothing bad can happen to the dog, either emotionally, mentally, or physically. And then the second thing is you start at a great distance where the dog knows it for themselves, and you work closer. And in my opinion, mm -hmm. I do have a 10 pound dog, a small dog. I do not allow my small dog to interact with larger dogs uh, for safety yeah. reasons. He, he's fine around them and he can be in the same space, but I have enough concern about accidental harm uh, mm -hmm. Even with my puppy, remember my puppy's 50 pounds and he takes mm -hmm. his paw and he goes across the top of my small dog's face and he doesn't mean anything. But I stop that behavior right away because Dry. it pisses off the little dog and the little dog is a terrier and the little dog has no sense. And so he'll bite, he'll go after the big dog, which would be a disaster. I mean, he could die. Yes if they get in a fight. Um, yes. So I would say, I don't think it's a reasonable expectation to expect small dogs to physically interact freely with bigger dogs. I think that's maybe a safety issue that would be beyond my mm -hmm. reason. Um, right. So that I would make the goal safety with everybody staying to their handlers, the big dogs mm -hmm. and the small dogs, uh, and uh, start with great distance and then bring the distance right. closer as the dog shows comfort. 
Absolutely, yes. So um, just I'm quickly going to share, um, Denise, I'm quickly going to share your online school link. Guys, whoever is interested, um, I know I am, you can uh, check out Denise's website, www.fenzydogsportsacademy.com. I'll repeat that. That's www.fenzydogsportsacademy.com. Um, you can find her on Instagram on, at Fenzy Dog Sports Academy. Denise also has a lovely blog, www.denisefenzy.com. And of course, on Instagram, you can follow her on Riker's mom. I hope I got that right. Is it? It's Riker. Yeah, I will say I'm probably more active on Facebook than anywhere. And almost every day mm -hmm. I put up either a training video to help you understand behavior or I have a Wonderful. conversation. So today I talked about cues. So I put up this mm -hmm. morning um, a short paragraph or a few paragraphs on how to add a cue to behaviors. So I do that almost every right. day. It's just sort of free stuff. You can ask me questions there. I'm very responsive. So feel free to Absolutely. follow me on, on Facebook. Excellent. So um, just before we end, guys, I have, uh, you know, I've put up the website address. You can always look it up. Uh, thank you so much, Denise. I think this has been um, a very enlightening session for me and I'm sure for all of the pet parents and dog trainers and behaviorists that have tuned in. Um, thank you, Dog Spot, for hosting yet another lovely session, uh, for having me. Um, my name is Sahil Sharma, and you can find me on Pawswag, that's I, on Facebook as well as Instagram. And um, you can look up Denise uh, on Instagram at Riker's mom and um, her online school, FenzyDogSportsAcademy.com. So that's it for us uh, tonight on, dogs, uh, on dogspot.in. Denise, thank you so much. I think it was wonderful hosting you tonight. Thank you. Well, I had a wonderful time. Great questions. Great audience here. Thank you. Fantastic. All right, then. So that's good night from us in India. Bye-bye.